Welcome to this seventh and penultimate reflection in our Passion Tide retreat. I think I got the wrong number last time, so I think there are probably two number fives, but anybody who knows me well will know that maths was never my strong suit. Anyway, yesterday and in our last reflection, we were thinking about the centrality of the Holy Eucharist and the priesthood in our lives. And today, Friday in this fifth week of Lent, Passion Week, is also a commemoration of the seven sorrows of our Blessed Lady. So I thought it would be good for us to have a Marian reflection in our retreat today. Any consideration of the Holy Eucharist brings us inevitably to the foot of the cross. For it is there that we also see the greatest flowering of Mary's motherhood. Her son enters his greatest moment of priestly mediation and she becomes not only Mater Redemptoris, the mother of the Redeemer, but also Mater Ecclesiae, mother of the church. In order to understand something of this essential co-redemptive mission of the mother of God, we have to enter deeply into the priesthood of Christ and attempt to appreciate something of its fundamental significance. The late Dominican theologian, Cardinal Pierre Paul Philippe, a major formative influence on St John Paul II, whose doctoral thesis he supervised at the Angelicum, expresses it in these words. We will never be able to comprehend, far less understand, the role which Our Lady has played next to Christ the High Priest, if we do not approach it from the perspective of God. Thus, we need to contemplate how God sees Mary from all eternity, or in other words, we should consider her from the standpoint of her predestination. You will know, I'm sure, that the Church has constantly taught that all of the privileges enjoyed by the Blessed Virgin Mary spring from her divine mission as the Mother of the Saviour. All that she is and all that she does serves to associate her as perfectly as possible with the two defining mysteries of her Son. His incarnation, through which he inaugurates his priestly life, and the redemption by which he brings to fruition the supreme act of this priesthood in the sacrifice of himself for the salvation of the world. It is most essential for us to grasp this fundamental fact at the outset, for it is the supreme basis of Mary's co-redemptive role in God's saving plan. Mary's intimate association with her son in his saving mysteries is part of the divine will from the outset. A fact which is so often overlooked in many Marian studies and reflections. St John Paul II, probably the greatest Mar Marian theologian the papacy has ever produced, makes reference to this fundamental fact of Mary's predestination in his apostolic letter, Redemptoris Mater. He writes, In the mystery of Christ, Mary is already present, even before the creation of the world, as the one whom the Father has chosen to be the mother of his Son in the Incarnation. The Son, together with the Father, has chosen her, entrusting her from all time to the Spirit of holiness. In this way we can understand that by the humble obedience of Our Lady's fiat, her acceptance at the moment of the Annunciation of God's will, she is immersed in these saving mysteries, not merely by her physical participation, the fact that she is the source of the humanity of the Saviour, but expressly by her maternal cooperation. Mary does not cooperate in the mystery of redemption purely by her physical presence 
at the foot of the cross, but rather is being intimately united in the suffering and the offering which her son is making. In this, she is the mother of the high priest, called to cooperate in the priestly activity of her son, who by his self-offering is the saviour of the world. This fact on relation to the Virgin Mary is already explicit at the moment of the Annunciation, which we should look upon not merely as the beginning of Mary's cooperation, but rather as the highest point in the process of the uniting of her will with that of the Blessed Trinity. Once again, we turn to St. John Paul II when he describes this process, saying, Within the redemptive economy of grace brought about through the action of the Holy Spirit, there exists a unique correspondence between the moment of the Incarnation and the moment of the birth of the Church. The person who links together these mo two moments is Mary, Mary at Nazareth and Mary at the Cenacle in Jerusalem. In both cases, her discreet yet essential presence indicates the path of the birth from the Holy Spirit. When we hear this, it prompts in our mind a question. How did Christ become a priest? St Thomas explains that it was through Mary that Christ was made priest, because it was through her that he united his divine and human natures, becoming the one mediator between God and man. This is effected not by a special act of consecration, like an ordination, but rather by the very act of the Incarnation. By becoming the son of Mary, the Son of God became a priest. While this seems somewhat straightforward logic, it occasions much debate, not only among theologians who do not share our Catholic faith, but even some who do. The same reluctance is found in relation to the doctrine of Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. While all such theologians would accept that Mary is the sole agent in the mystery of the Incarnation, and thus the only source of Christ's humanity, some of the same theologians find difficulty in accepting the logical implication in this truth for the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. In the same way, it is important to assert that the essential participation of Mary in the process whereby Christ becomes the sole mediator or priest of the new covenant does not in any way compromise the uniqueness of his mediation. By offering herself for the incarnation of God's word, Mary lived her Eucharistic faith even before the institution of the Eucharist, which took place at the Last Supper. At the Annunciation, when Mary conceived the Son of God, she foreshadowed in her own self what happens to each of us when we receive Holy Communion. As a result, in the words of St John Paul II, there is a profound analogy between the fiat which Mary offers in reply to the angel and the amen which every believer says when receiving the body of the Lord. In this way, we can see how Mary's belief in the mystery of the Annunciation anticipates the Church's belief in the Holy Eucharist. Furthermore, we can say that in her daily and remote preparation for her son's sacrifice at Calvary, Our Lady experienced a kind of anticipated Eucharist. One might say a spiritual communion of both desire and oblation, which would culminate in her union with her son in the offering of his passion while she stood at the foot of the cross and then subsequently finds expression after the resurrection in her partaking of the Holy Eucharist, which the Apostles celebrated as the memorial of that passion. According to St. John Paul II, in the Eucharist, 
the church is completely united to Christ and his sacrifice and makes her own the spirit of Mary. We can understand this truth more deeply by rereading the Magnificat, which is Our Lady's Song of Praise, in a Eucharistic key. St John Paul II points out that when Mary proclaims, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, she is praising God through Jesus, who is in her womb, in Jesus and with Jesus. This, he observes, is the true Eucharistic attitude, and that the Eucharist has been given to us so that our life, like that of Mary, may become completely a Magnificat. Interestingly, St Louis Marie Grignon de Montfort, who greatly inspired St John Paul II, recommended that the Magnificat be said after the reception of Holy Communion. When we do so, we unite our voice with that of Mary, making her great hymn our own, and thus we allow our often weak faith to be infused by her perfect and unfailing faith. This brings us back continually to the foot of the cross. It is there that we see that in his dying moments, the Saviour bequeaths to his church the intimate relationships which most characterise his earthly life and ministry. The relationship with his mother and the relationship with his closest friend and collaborator, St John. In this last act of inestimable significance, Christ bequeaths his mother to the disciple he loved. These two relationships, which most characterise his earthly life and redemptive mission, are forever bound to each other. Now in this bequest, the church has always understood that Mary became the mother of the priestly church of, of her son, represented at the foot of the cross by the beloved disciple John. At that moment, she became his mother, just as up to that moment, she had been the mother of Christ. The relationship which united her to Christ, the eternal priest, will now continue in her relationship with St John and the priestly church, which is coming to birth as her son dies on the cross. For the church, a mother. For the mother, an alter Christus, a priestly son, representative of the many priests who will subsequently be called into the intimacy of this relationship. This essentially Marian character of the church is evident not only at the cross, where Father Faber says that the faith of the entire church was present in the heart of Mary, but it also is also evident in a particularly significant way on the day of Pentecost. There, in the Cenacle, we see that the church is Marian at its beginning. In his encyclical Ecclesia de Eucharistia, Pope St John Paul II devotes an entire chapter to Mary, woman of the Eucharist. He observes that there Although at first glance the Gospel is silent on the subject of Mary and the Eucharist, we know that Mary was present with the Apostles who prayed with one accord, as we're told in the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Therefore it follows that she was most certainly present at the Eucharistic celebrations of the early Christians, who were devoted, we're told in the second chapter of Acts, to the breaking of bread. In fact, the Acts of the Apostles is a source for us of what we might identify as the three characteristics of the church present in the upper room at Pentecost. We're told three things about the church at that stage. Firstly, that they were all concordes. They were of one heart or mind, that they were perseverantibus in oratione, 
persevering in prayer, cum Maria with Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's natural to expect that in the period between the Ascension and Pentecost, Our Lady would have provided an important focus for the Apostles as they prepared for the coming of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of their most important work. She would have continued her silent prayer as at the foot of the cross, inspiring them by her presence to enter deeply into the mystery of the Church in which she herself was already immersed. At the cross, she stands beside the eternal priest as he accomplishes his perfect sacrifice. At Pentecost, she stands with his priestly church as it is coming to birth. The same spirit which overshadowed Mary at the moment of the incarnation is now active in bringing to birth a priestly church which will continue his mission in the world. It's vitally important to stress the priestly character of the Church at Pentecost, a fact which is too often overlooked. Tradition tells us that the gathering took place at the Cenacle, the place of the Last Supper, and the place of the institution, tradition tells us, of four sacraments. In that place, the Apostles had received the special consecration of ordination to the fullness of Christ's priesthood at the Last Supper. From Pentecost onwards, they will share this precious gift of God for his church, bringing others into this most powerful identification with the crucified and risen Lord in the act of sanctifying the church. Whilst we would wish to see the whole church present at the foot of the cross and in the cenacle at Pentecost, experiencing this particular maternity of Mary, we would also wish to recognise that in both moments, Our Lady becomes a mother to those who share her son's priesthood in a most explicit way. Those who have received his priesthood through the special consecration of ordination, his ministerial priests. At the wedding of Cana, the prayerful and persistent intervention of Mary resulted in the inauguration of the public ministry of her son. At Pentecost, Mary's prayer brings about a transformation of the apostles in the power of the Holy Spirit, making them other Christs and enabling the church to begin its priestly mission in the world. In both cases, the maternal intercession of Mary in favour of others is decisive. At the foot of the cross, she received St John as another Christ, the first of many that she will take into her heart, loving each one as she loves her son. Pope St John Paul II often spoke about this capacity of Mary to love priests. This maternal intercession in favour of priests bears the same characteristics that were present in her decisive presence and intervention at Cana, at the cross and at Pentecost, bringing forth in priests their ministry, their sacrifice and their sanctification. Cardinal Pierre-Paul Philippe explains it in this way. The Blessed Virgin Mary from the heights of heaven clearly sees in our soul the indelible character of Christ and knows with a divine knowledge the mission which every one of us must carry out as priests of Christ. She knows that our Lord has decreed that he will be represented on earth by men who carry his priesthood in their spiritual being. You will know, I'm sure, that the Church's sacramental theology explains to us how men are rendered participants in the one priesthood of Christ by sacramental ordination. According to God's providential plan, however, this supernatural transformation cannot be implemented without the maternal participation of Mary. St Louis Grignon de Montfort speaks of a necessary process of filiation by which Mary gives sons to the church. 
This is what he writes. God the Father wants sons from Mary, as in the case of a natural generation where there is a father and a mother, so in the same way on the supernatural level there is a father who is God and a mother who is Mary. He who does not have Mary for a mother cannot have God for a father. It would seem that Our Lady shows to priests the maternal love which she had for St John a love which extends far beyond protection to a very real desire for the sanctification of her sons. As model of the church, Mary not only symbolises the holiness which every member of the church should embody, she is actively at work to bring about that holiness in those who turn to her. This is a direct consequence of her participation in the mystery of Christ's redemptive work, by which the man who stands with her at the foot of the cross represents all those who will come after him. Therefore, she who is present in the mystery of Christ as mother becomes present in the mystery of the church. Mary's intimate participation in the mysteries of salvation unites her profoundly to Christ's saving action and every means by which the divine will makes that saving action present in the world. Here is the anomaly. She is essentially linked to the priestly offering of her son and to those who share his one priesthood, but she is not a priest herself. At times in the past, this has caused a certain amount of confusion both in the theological discussion of the nature of the priesthood and in Marian iconography. You must know, I'm sure, that the church prohibits representations of Mary in priestly vestments. St Albert the Great explains it in this way. The Blessed Virgin Mary was not chosen by the Lord to be a minister, but to be the spouse. That help according to what is stated in the book of Genesis. Let us make him a helpmate. The Blessed Virgin is not a vicar or agent, but a coadjutrix and a companion, participating in the kingdom as she has participated in the passion, when all the ministers and disciples had run away and she alone remained at the foot of the cross. The wounds which Christ received in his body, Mary felt in her heart. In this way, we can understand that although Mary is not a priest, she is entirely joined to the priestly offering of her son. She herself offered him to the father in the act of the presentation in the temple an offering which prefigured the sacrifice she would make in the moment of his passion and death. In this, she is a pattern for those who share Christ's priesthood and are exhorted at their ordination to allow themselves to be transformed by the sacrifice they offer. The priest is helped in his oblation by the example and intercession of Our Lady bound to her in an intimacy which is willed by God at the very moment the sacrament of the church is coming to birth on the cross, as he offers the supreme sacrifice for salvation at the altar. She stands at his side as a model of one who responds to the invitation of that sacrifice. Mary unites herself to the offering of Christ her son, and is therefore united to the offering of his priests, each one an altar Christus, another Christ, continuing his one unique offering in time and space, allowing the possibility of the fruits of its grace to be applied to the world. Surely this is the meaning of the uniting of Our Lady and St John at the foot of the cross. In that most powerful moment of the sacrifice which changes human destiny for eternity, this union of hearts is of immense significance. Mary is already united perfectly to the heart of her son. 
Now she is united to the heart of St John, a union which echoes through time. One of the great spiritual writers of the French school, Monsieur Ollier, explains, St John was for Mary the continuation of Jesus Christ, and in the culminating moment of his ministry, he was entirely hers. He had to enter into her intentions and lose his own intentions in those of Mary. He was given to her as her own special priest, so as to offer up the sacrifice for the intentions she wished. The cumulative effect of this idea of intense union should begin to dawn on us, bringing an, an equally intense awareness of the Marian character of the priesthood as willed by God. Indeed, it's hard to conceive of a truly Catholic understanding of the priesthood without reference to its essentially Marian character. In his Holy Thursday letter to priests of 1979, St. John Paul II wrote, There is in our priestly ministry the stupendous and penetrating awareness of the nearness of the Mother of Christ. We have to admit that often this is entirely overlooked when we speak and teach of the priesthood. Because the priesthood is so closely linked to the Eucharistic mystery of the Church, we so often fall short of recognising its all-important Marian aspect. St John Paul II also reminds us that Mary is present at the memorial, the liturgical action, for she was present at the sacrificial event. She is present on every altar where the memorial of the Passion Resurrection is celebrated. For she was present at the event of the historic and salvific death of Christ, intimately adhering with her entire being to the plan of the Father. So we can understand she was present then, she's present now. She stood by Christ, she stood by John. She continues to stand by those of us who as priests have come after him. In a beautiful apostolic exhortation entitled Sacramentum Caritatis, the Sacrament of Love, issued in 1997, Pope Benedict XVI wrote these words in a section entitled The Eucharist and the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's quite uh, a developed train of thought, so I ask you to try and stay with this if you can. Um, I'm going to read it in its entirety. From the relationship between the Eucharist and the individual sacraments, and from the eschatological significance of the sacred mysteries, the overall shape of the Christian life emerges, a life called, at all times, to be an act of spiritual worship, a self-offering pleasing to God, Although we are all still journeying towards the complete fulfilment of our hope, this does not mean that we cannot already gratefully acknowledge that God's gift to us have found their perfect fulfilment in the Virgin Mary, Mother of God and our Mother. Mary's assumption, body and soul, into heaven is for us a sign of sure hope, for it shows us on our pilgrimage through time the eschatological goal of which the sacrament of the Eucharist enables us even now to have a foretaste. In Mary Most Holy, we also see perfectly fulfilled the sacramental way that God comes down to meet his creatures and involves them in his saving work. From the Annunciation to Pentecost, Mary of Nazareth appears as someone whose freedom is completely open to God's will. Her immaculate conception is revealed precisely in her unconditional docility to God's word. Obedient faith in response to God's work shapes her life at every moment. A virgin attentive to God's word, she lives in complete harmony with his will. She treasures in her heart the words that come to her from God 
and piecing them together like a mosaic, she learns to understand them more deeply. Mary is the great believer who places herself confidently in God's hands, abandoning herself to his will. This mystery deepens as she becomes completely involved in the redemptive mission of Jesus. In the words of the Second Vatican Council, the Blessed Virgin advanced in her pilgrimage of faith and faithfully persevered in her union with her son until she stood at the cross, in keeping with the divine plan, suffering deeply with her only begotten son, associating herself with his sacrifice in her mother's heart, and lovingly consenting to the immolation of the victim who was born of her. Finally, she was given by the same Christ Jesus dying on the cross as a mother to his disciple. With these words, woman, behold your son. From the Annunciation to the cross, Mary is the one who received the word made flesh within her and then silenced in death. It is she, lastly, who took into her arms the lifeless body of the one who truly loved his own to the end. Consequently, every time we approach the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharistic liturgy, we also turn to her who, by her complete fidelity, received Christ's sacrifice for the whole church. The Synod Fathers rightly declared that Mary inaugurates the Church's participation in the sacrifice of the Redeemer. She is the Immaculata, who received God's gift unconditionally and is thus associated with his work of salvation. Mary of Nazareth, icon of the nascent Church, is the model for each of us called to receive the gift that Jesus makes of himself in the Eucharist. I think it's really important for us to explore some of the theological ideas which underpin this understanding of the relationship between Mary's sharing in the sacrifice of her son, which brings about redemption, and the ministerial priesthood of the Catholic Church, which is the fruit of that same mystery. I think we're doing so now at a time when many consider there to be a crisis, not only of vocations to the priesthood, but also in a general understanding of the true nature of the priesthood. I don't suppose it will come as any surprise to you that I am personally convinced that a Marian understanding of the priesthood is in every sense the answer to this crisis. Whether it is a crisis in the personal lives of so many priests who seem to struggle to remain faithful, or a lack of understanding on the part of many Catholics of the centrality of the priesthood in God's saving plan, this essentially Marian character of the priesthood should also be clearly evident in our preparation of candidates for ordination, all of whom should be encouraged to explicitly consecrate themselves and their future priesthood to the Mother of God. In preparing these thoughts for this retreat reflection, I was struck by the nature of the love which Our Lady has for St John, the beloved disciple. It's a love which, in the words of the French writer Saint-Exupéry, does not consist in two people looking at one another, but rather both looking in the same direction. The love of Our Lady for priests is the direct consequence of the fact that her entire being is focused on the person of her son. When we contemplate the scene at the foot of the cross, it is a scene of very great sadness. We contemplate this very particular and personal sadness in the beautiful sequence which we had at today's Mass of the Seven Sorrows of Mary, and which we hear on the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows on the 15th of September, and we often sing at Lent when we are meditating on the Stations of the Cross. 
There is a beauty in the pathos in this sadness. It is the beauty of a love which is both crucified and resurrected. For such is the love of Mary, not only for priests, but for the whole church. In recovering a real and substantial sense of the presence and the importance of Mary in the Eucharistic mystery, let us turn to her, particularly during this time of our very great difficulty. Let us turn to her as mother of the eternal priest, mother of all priests, mother of the church. Let us be inspired by her to enter more deeply into this great mystery and let us acknowledge our need of her now and always. We fly to thy patronage, our Holy Mother of God, despise not our prayers and our necessities, but deliver us from all danger, all glorious and ever blessed Virgin. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, St. Joseph, St. Thomas Apostle, St. Philip Neri, St. John Henry Newman, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.